uh, was seen from 100 miles away. It was a pretty big bang. Uh, there were articles in the newspaper. Ammunition dump blows up. Nobody injured, fortunately. I've got some of those articles. They got good at covering things up. What we feel, based on all the reports, this would be the epicenter of the crash site right here. It was, it was virtually intact. Right. So was it a soft landing? Was it a crash? We don't know. This, now, there's a plaque over here. So this is a commemorative plaque of the... Of the alleged the incident. Recovery at Heart Canyon. Honor about this site on March 25th, 1948. The spacecraft of origins unknown crash landed on this mesa. The 767th A&W radar base in nearby El Vado, New Mexico, tracked the errant landing to this site. High security recovery operation took approximately two weeks with all remains being taken to Los Alamos, New Mexico, for scientific study and evaluation by some of the world's leading scientists. And Los Alamos is, what, two hours from here? Two and a half? Yeah, about 127 miles as the crow flies. Sure. The recovery of this craft by the U.S. government and military was one of the most secretive recoveries of spacecraft with origins unknown since the similar recovery in Roswell, New Mexico, eight months earlier. Sadly, all occupants, as many as 16, died as the result of this crash, making full disclosure of both purpose and or origination all but impossible. That was put here in 1999. Three years after the symposium started. Uh, one year. One, oh, right. Yeah, yeah one year. 98 was the first year. Right. So this is it. Not much to look at, but... No, not who, really. Who knows what happened here? A lot of twisted dead trees, a lot of broken off trees, and a big open space that, uh, about 35 feet wide, 110 feet long. And the only question is... What crashed here? Did anything crash here? Yeah. All right. I love visiting New Mexico. Not just because I'm interested in the UFO phenomenon, but because its vast, empty spaces are so different, so alien, one might say, to my home, Halifax, Nova Scotia, a bustling cosmopolitan seaport on Canada's east coast. Out here, I sometimes feel that I'm at the edge of the world. And yet, there are similarities between New Mexico and Nova Scotia. Friendly people, for example that might not be readily apparent, but which do exist. These common elements are also present in the Roswell and Aztec UFO incidents, no matter how much the skeptics might tell you otherwise. Let's do a comparison of Roswell and Aztec. Roswell made the front page of many, many newspapers across the country. We had an intelligence officer who was given the release to go ahead and release the information to the press, later retracting it the next day. Aztec, we may have one newspaper article that made it out that has conveniently disappeared out of the archives. You hear the argument, we don't have eyewitnesses at Aztec. Well, we didn't have eyewitnesses four or five years ago. We have eyewitnesses now. Unfortunately, some are deceased. One key eyewitness that we had, and he's deceased now, was Doug Nolan. Uh, grew up in the Four Corners area, at 19 years of age, worked for the El Paso Oil Company. Was in his truck that day, that over the radio, they had an old Motorola radio in the truck, uh, traveling with his boss, Bill Ferguson. They were called on the radio to get out to Hart Canyon because of the brush fire, the infamous brush fire we hear about. Upon uh, arriving at the crash site, uh, they were told by other workers the brush fires on one side. They were worried about a drip tank uh, getting ignited in the brush fire. Upon arrival there, other oil field workers told them that it's not the brush fire you got to see. You got to see what's laying up on the mesa. Doug went on to tell us all the locals that were there, the police, the two police officers that were there. His boss, Bill Ferguson, who's probably deceased, although we were still looking for him. I had the luxury of interviewing Doug back uh, about October of 2003, and he passed away December 7th. Uh, that we have an eyewitness. We have a deathbed confession. Doug had had six strokes from June until October. Uh, he was 
very slow and methodical in recalling the incident and appeared to be very credible in the interview. In the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, we were contacted by a gentleman, Ken Farley from Bat Cave, Arizona. And Ken uh, wanted to talk to us. He was in very bad health. Randy Barnes and I met down in uh, Phoenix, rented a car, drove up, interviewed Ken for probably three hours, took very good notes. Ken was uh, very ill, on oxygen. He has since passed away. Ken told his side of the story that uh, he was in Durango, passing through to San Diego, fresh out of the military. Met a friend in uh, Cedar Hill, a drop-off point where he was to pick him up and keep traveling to San Diego. His friend told him there was a lot of commotion going on out on Hart Canyon Road and they thought an aircraft had gone down. Ken and his friend uh, got to the crash site and walked out to the western side of where the disc was. And at that point, a group of people from Aztec, the oil field people, uh, two law enforcement officers showed up, who were already actually at the scene. And uh, we found Ken's story believable, but we had a hard time digesting the two police officers. We figured today if you were out there and you called 911, you'd be lucky to get one in a reasonable time frame. Not, no disrespect to the local law enforcement, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. And the fact that there's two police officers out there, we had a little bit of a problem with. We didn't write off his interview. We kind of parked it over in the, the holding pen until we got uh, more eyewitnesses. And in 2003, we, were, we contacted Doug Nolan, who had contacted Bill Steinman. It was one of the leftover leads Bill never got to after the book was published. Doug told an interesting story, which was very believable, backed up with names of other local residents. But about three quarters of the way through the interview, he mentions the other police officer. And I stopped Doug and I said, what other police officer? He said, well, we had the local police officer. And then another gentleman, young guy. Well, Doug was 19 at the time and said that police officer was about his age, slightly older. That police officer didn't seem to intermingle with the locals. So Doug went over and talked to him and he said he was from the town of Cuba, New Mexico, which is southeast of El Aztec. That police officer claimed he had followed the craft that night up what is now 550, the old Highway 44. We dug into the details as best Doug, again, was dying. He had had six strokes since past June. Doug also said uh, he was going through who was at the crash site that day. He could remember all but two people because he didn't know who they were. And I asked him who, and he said two young guys, maybe three that stood at the western side of the crash site. At that point, that tied in Ken Farley's story. Also, backing up his claim about the two police officers. So we had stories that were now starting to connect with witnesses. In the winter of 2002, I was contacted by Glenn Pace. Glenn Pace was uh, born and raised in the Farmington area. Uh, subsequently, he was interviewed uh, extensively by Linda Moulton Howe. Told a very interesting story as a young man delivering papers uh, a day or two after the Aztec crash. Back then, the local paper was called The Hustler. That's since then, since then, it's now the Farmington Daily Times. 